So for reasons that will become extremely obvious, I have to thank uh, Michael for heralding the topic of my talk. Um, well, slides, slides, slides. Um, and I also want to thank the Sackler Foundation and the symposium organizers, Tom, Marla, and Jean. I think we all agree this is going to be a really wonderful experience, and already this morning has been terrific. Uh, this might be a bit of a down version, I'm, yeah, but I'm stand between you and lunch, so I should get on. Um, we're here, of course, to consider how and uh, early adversity gets biologically embedded or, as we've been saying, under the skin to influence the physical, physical and mental health throughout the life course. And this question, as Tom eloquently made me cry at the end of his talk, uh, indicated is not just a scientific question for us to ponder, but it has implications for practice and for policy. And ever since Jack Schoenkopf who will be presenting later in this meeting, formed the National Scientific Council for the Developing Child. Um, I have been one of his minions, carrying the water about the, what we know about the science of early development to civic leaders and policymakers in hopes that if we can help them understand that science, it will shift the kinds of policies that are put into place for children uh, who are growing up under difficult adverse circumstances. Let's see, are we almost? Hello? There we go. Good. Um, and because, as we've certainly uh, been hearing, stress plays a role in all of our models of how early adversity gets under the skin to influence health outcomes and behavioral and mental health outcomes, what I've been doing and what the rest of us on the council have been doing, um, guided by the, with the help of Frameworks, uh, which is a communication organization that understands how to communicate to the public better than we scientists do, we've been going out and talking and trying to explain that what we understand about stress, how it influences the brain, the potential toxic effects that chronic stress can have on brain development. And I view this as this narrative as the doom and gloom narrative about early experiences, later outcomes, let us you know, get your attention by the doom and the gloom so that you will do something to shift the odds for children early in life uh, to reduce those adversities so that we'll have a healthier um, population so that individual children will have better opportunities to grow up and take advantage as of the fruits of an industrialized society. But there is another narrative, and it's the narrative that Michael began to build clearly for us here in this last session. And it's a narrative that Robert Hind has uh, contributed to and so on. It's the narrative of evolutionary biology, which is that any time we see a pattern of outcomes in response to an environment that's frequent, that happens often, that happens predictably, that out set of outcomes can't be impairments, in a sense, on an evolutionary scale, because if it only impaired us, it would quickly get eliminated from our genetic pool and we wouldn't be seeing it. So if we're seeing it frequently, it has to be a form of adaptation. Okay? And I have noticed that when we shift the narrative and begin to describe what's happening to kids in adverse early circumstances, not as impairments, but as exquisite adaptations to their environment. There is a whole shift in tone in the room. And Jack, I have to apologize right now, because we work hard to make sure our narratives are consistent. And I have, in a sense, been going off of the council script and trying out this uh, kind of more adaptive narrative with the public. And what I don't know at this point is which shifts the dials more in terms of policy, presenting kids as impaired and therefore we must get in and fix them, or helping to folks to understand the exquisite adaptation to adversity, which nonetheless can get in their way of becoming members of uh, the executive class that gets to be the 1% rather than the 99% on Wall Street. But to get to that narrative, as Michael indicated, we are shifting, in a sense, our lenses about how we understand 
early adversity. We're shifting, in a sense, from our more proximal lens when we're understanding the mechanisms, the biology, the associations on an individual or more proximal level. And we shift to this ultimate level of evolutionary thinking, evolutionary biology. And we begin to ask questions not about what is happening, but in a sense about why it's happening. When I'm talking to audiences, I hit a certain point where I've got them all totally appalled with the science of the, the proximal, what's really happening potentially to the neurons, and I shift to, but of course, it's not be happening because nature hates you. There's maybe you know, a different narrative here that it's happening because it's been selected to support um, our ability to survive. But that's shifting to the ultimate level of, um, of discussion. So what I wanted to do today, and again, Michael set us up very, very well to do this, is to spend a little more time <coughs> contemplating this question of what happens when we approach our work and approach the translation of our work as impairment, and what happens when we shift that narrative, knowing that we're going to the ultimate level to do that, that, that functional level, which is also tricky to prove in humans, really tricky to prove in humans, um, when we shift to that ultimate level and start talking about exquisite adaptations. Um, and in the paper that Cam Hostenar is here today and I are writing for this volume, we're really trying to take that up. Today what I want to do, because I only have a few minutes and not as much time as in this paper, is to use two th sort of theoretical orientations as vehicles to, to talk about the difference between focusing on impairments and focusing on um, exquisite adaptations. And the two theories are what, uh, both, the first one is very common theory for us to point to in the area, and this is, you'll be hearing more about this tonight, so Bruce, I'm not going to s explain your theory away in five seconds. Um, and it's the allostatic load model. It is a model that I view as existing on the proximal level, explains what's happening and how it's happening. Um, it's a model that argues that frequent activation of stress mediating or allostatic mediating systems, important for our immediate survival, but they uh, bear a cost. There's an accumulative allostatic load that ultimately when we get to the point of an overload, in a sense, we get dysregulation of stress mediating systems and we get the emergence of disease and disorders. It was a theory that was developed, in a sense, to explain the process linking stress to disease and much of the work on it happened in the context to the MacArthur socioeconomic class um, network where they were trying to link socioeconomic class to disease. So it's a beautiful theory if what you want to do is doom and gloom and call to arms um, based on the idea that if we don't get in there early and fix these adversities for kids, we risk really having a huge public health problem. And in the narrative of the um, National Scientific Council, you either pay now or you pay a lot more later, Mr. Policymaker, Ms. Policymaker. So let's reduce adversities for young children. The other model is uh, explicitly an evolutionary developmental model. The mo it's an updated model of the biological sensitivity to context theory that Tom Boyce and Bruce Ellis, who is here today, proposed about seven years ago. Actually, they probably wrote it a little bit before that. I know it took a while to get through the review at Development and Psychopathology, because I was one of the reviewers and I gave them a lot of problems. Um, but it's great theory and it's generating a lot of research. The updated version, and Bruce, how do you say this band's name? I can never say it. Thank you. Uh, Ellis and Shirtcliffe produced, um, and it came out last year, and it's what they call an adaptive calibration model. And um, the goal of this model, using evolutionary developmental theory, is to describe individual differences in stress responsivity and their development, but from the concept that all of these frequent patterns that we see must have uh, an adaptive function if we go and think on the ultimate. Um, evolutionary level. So I'm going to contrast those two 
uh, not because they're the only two that I could contrast, but they sit there on these two different levels. Both of these uh, have commonalities, of course. Uh, they both view, in terms of stress, the response system that the brain coordinates, a distributed, dynamic, and plastic set of neural circuits that regulate behavior and physiological stress systems, and that any particular instance of activating these systems is you know, understood from the standpoint of it facilitates your ability to survive that, um, that instance of threat or challenge. But they have differences, of course, and um, there are three. One that I've alluded to and we'll keep coming back to is they deal differently with this idea of adaptation versus impairment. They're weighted differently in what they emphasize. Uh, they differ in terms of whether they have a de real developmental orientation or how they deal with that. And they differ in how they deal with individual differences. Because I don't have that much time today, what we're going to do is talk about adaptation versus impairment, again Michael set me up so beautifully, within the context of talking about developmental process and in the paper Cam and I then also uh, deal with uh, thinking about individual differences. So, let's see if I remembered what I'm all going to say here. Okay, there we go. So as we've just heard beautifully from Michael, um, with regards to the development of the neurobiology of stress, it's important to take a developmental account. Uh, development into account. Most of us would agree, and I know this is true of Michael and of Bruce McEwen, that what Michael was talking about is not really an instance of allostatic load, right? You'd agree. Um, that it's hard to use an allostatic load model to really to really talk about the kinds of experience, the early licking and grooming, high or low licking and grooming, in part because that variation actually doesn't activate stress biology concurrently, as I understand it. And in fact, you can adrenalectomize and have constant uh, infusions of stress hormones, and you still see those effects. It's something that's happening prior to the time where we could put an allostatic load model in to, to sort of give us an uh, understanding of what's happening, and in fact, it appears to have some elements of predictive adaptation. Uh, as uh, Mike Rudder has talked about it, it seems, if anything, to be preparing the organism um, for the nature of its uh, later, um, what the environment is going to be later in its development. Now, I've thought a lot <laughs> about um, whether when I take the animal models that Michael has been describing, of course, have been out there for quite a while um, in different forms, and try to apply those to human development. Should I, postnatal development, postnatal development, should I be looking through the lens of uh, allostatic load models to explain and think about what I'm looking at? Or should I be looking through the lens of a developmental evolutionary biology model and wondering and thinking in terms of predictive adaptation? And the reason I've spent a lot of time thinking about this is unfortunately, for us in terms of easy translation, uh, human beings are born at a different point in neurobehavioral, neurobiological development than our rodents. We're, we're a lot more mature at the point that we come out than the infant rat is, and we're a lot more mature especially in terms of uh, our stress response system. The hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system is just a lot more mature at birth in the human than in the rat. And in some sense, some of the systems that are probably being affected in the rodent are systems that are emerging and developing in the last trimester of human pregnancy, which has led many of us to wonder, well, maybe it's prenatal stress where we're going to see the most direct implications. On the other hand, the problem that is being raised, the idea that you may need to have the parents sort of providing a signal to the offspring about what the nature of the world is like out there is not just a problem that would be there in the rodent, it certainly is there in the human, and in a beautiful paper um, that Mike Meany and Moshe Ziff produced in 2005, they started out with water fleas? Right, and showed across bees. We've got these problems. So it may not be the, the, the whole sort of 
functional question may not be specific to how old your brain or body is at the point where you emerge from the womb, whether it's a pre or a postnatal story. The groups that I work with is I study children who are adopted from orphanages. Um, and I study them because in many ways they are a human analog of many of the animal studies of early deprivation. Right? They are about as close as we get, not to the low licking and grooming, but to the true deprivation models that have been frequently used in studying animals. The children are raised in an institutional setting where, by virtue of the need to have a few adults take care of a lot of children, you see a relatively low amount of individualized attention, a lot of routinized care, and uh, low levels then of stimulation and especially of response contingent kind of, of stimulation that the children receive. And I study these children after they've been adopted into families, but others study them in the context of uh, the institution or orphanage, and we see a number of, of commonalities, sort of characteristics that are very, um, that are very character things that are very characteristic of children growing up under conditions of low deprivation or of high deprivation, low nurturance. One of the things that is fascinating is that you see growth delay when children are in institutional settings, that is, growth is slowed, linear growth especially is slowed. I have, their estimates are that they lose about, of course, they're not shrinking, they're just not growing as fast as. They lose about one to two, one month of linear growth for every one to two to three months in an institutional setting. And then once, and it doesn't seem to be because of the nutrients that are available, though there's some of that probably going on, that you can manipulate the amount of attention that children receive in the institution, keep the food constant, and more attention, they start growing again. Once they're adopted and removed from that setting or fostered, as in Chuck Nelson's work, they start to grow fairly rapidly. They engage in what might be considered rebound growth. They don't quite make it back to where they would have probably been if they had been reared from birth in a high um, a nutrient rich kind of environment and a, a, a social stimulation rich environment. Um, they grow pretty rapidly, but if you look at them at their adult height, they're a little bit shorter um, um, than you'd expect. So there's partial growth recovery. I've shown that the activity of the HPA axis is sensitive to these early experiences, that we see long-term changes in the activity of that axis, especially for children who are growth stunted at the point of adoption. Um, Work of Nim Tottenham, who is here somewhere, has clearly shown that we see heightened anxiety, caution, maybe you call it neophobia, and her work has shown that we really see differential responsivity or reactivity of the amygdala. They are very similar to the animals, showing this kind of heightened uh, anxiety. And in a really characteristic of these kids. Um, we see changes in the uh, cap capacity for focused attention and the ability to ignore distractions. And many of them are, get labeled as having uh, ADHD. Um, this is so characteristic that Michael Rudder has suggested that it may be a deprivation specific effect, these uh, inattention and overactivity, as you call it, if you're from the other side of the pond. Okay. Um, so, the question is, how do I think about these kinds of effects? I can certainly fit them into a or an impairment kind of model. These, and these are, in many ways, clearly impairments. They put these kids at risk for school failure, for depression uh, in adolescence, for conduct disorders, if they show uh, these effects. So they clearly fit into an impairment model, but can I also turn around and try to put them into, um, a, from an ultimate perspective, from a predictive adaptation kind of model? And I think that we can. Um, we can think of this uh, growth delay, clearly, is, uh, is, seems to be there. Clearly, there's an easy argument that it's there to increase survival both in the institution. Growth is metabolically costly under conditions of deprivation. You are probably enhancing your survival capacity to be able to slow your growth down. We know some of the models for how this could happen. 
And in fact, it happens through a uh, talk, crosstalk between the stress axis, the HPA axis, which talks to the growth hormone axis, and essentially says, I'm, it's, I'm activated frequently here, and I am slowing down. I'm turning down the growth hormone axis. Once the kids get out, is there a predictive adaptation mode? Well, it seems to be possibly, you could say, it's programming um, the growth axis to reach maturity and reproductive maturity when you are physically smaller. Because if the, the expectation is a harsh environment, you're probably better not to put all of your energy into growth and actually start reproducing when you're a little bit smaller. Um, altered activity of the HPA axis is exactly ki the kind of argument that, uh, that Michael uh, presented, which is the idea if it's a harsh environment out there, then being more stress reactive and responsive to threat should facilitate your survival to reproductive maturity. Heightened anxiety and, caut and caution, if it's a harsh environment out there, you're probably more likely to survive to reproductive maturity if you are cautious and hesitant. Um, and very quickly learn when there is danger and don't need to, to try something three or four times to find out that I should avoid. In other words, conditioned fear responses should be ramped up and it would, it would improve your chances of survival. And ADHD symptoms, if we think of them as difficulty maintaining getting lost in thought so that you might not hear that footfall, which uh, signals that you're about to be attacked, well, you could see where ready distraction could well be um, a, a survival advantage. Okay. Um, of course, one thing to note in everything that I've just done, and one of the dangers, I think, of shifting to this ultimate model, is while it, re it changes our framework, it also, I mean, I was just making it up. <laughs> These are the just so stories. Sounds terrific, right? But can I prove it? Um, it shifts, I mean, Michael can prove it. The fruit fly friends of mine can prove these things because they can actually look at, design the conditions where you would look at reproductive fitness. Who wins out? Which pattern uh, wins out? Under which conditions? But I, I'm just making it up and figuring out what things I would need to predict to know that my story actually is a better one than the impairment story. Um, is something that, that is a big challenge for us. The idea of a predictive adaptation also creates headaches for developmentalists. And the headaches it creates, although it might be the right story, the headaches it creates, I'm trying to get to the headaches, oh, thank you very much, um, is that that language is one of early experiences setting developmental trajectories, <coughs> setting the organism up for the trajectories to towards certain outcomes. And while that kind of model is attractive, I mean, it's certainly great if you're talking to policymakers in the sense that you're, if you don't get in there early, you've set yourself up, you've set your state up for all these health outcomes that are going to cost you a fortune later on. So the trajectory thing is sort of nice in some sense. The problem is that we know from a lifetime of work by people in this room, Mike Rudder, uh, for example, that when we follow kids who have started out under risky circumstances, you may get set off on a developmental path. But if you follow development, rather than just looking back at it, if you follow it, the story is much more one of pathways with turning points, that there's the opportunities, things change. And there's the opportunity for better or for worse. Things can get better. Those turning points can mean things will get worse, but we can't make the predictions from early on typically to where the developmental projectile is going to actually land, which is why we do need to have some ideas about change and some theory of change. And I have to admit, this is one of the reasons that the adaptive calibration model, which I encourage you all to read since Bruce isn't giving a talk, Bruce Ellis is not giving a talk here, is attractive. And it's because the, this model is specifically set up to help us think about how there might be changes over the course of development in the reactivity of stress systems. It's built on the idea of, uh, bring it brings in the um, life history theory, combines it with, um, the think, uh, with the earlier uh, model, 
uh, which in life history theory talks about ways in which organisms allocate time and energy to various activities at different points in the life cycle. They bring in West Eberhard's arguments about switch control modular systems that shift you to onto, into different patterns as a function of your life history strategies and life cycles involving hormonal processes and shifts in gene regulation. And it talks, uh, life history theory proposes five different stages of in life history um, from conception to um, adulthood. And my only, one of my few quibbles with the ACM model right now is that they argue that in four of the five of them we're going to see shifts in the stress response system. And I want to know why we don't at age three to six. But that was a quibble. It's an interesting model, and I'm particularly interested in whether we do see shifts here in adolescence. That is, are you all, am I almost done? You are. Oh, my goodness. That is with puberty. <laughs> I'm not alone in arguing and thinking about puberty as a period of time when we may see an opening up of the, uh, of the capacity of neural systems to change a renewed period of plasticity. Um, Bruce McEwen and his student Romeo have written about this. Um, but to test, and I've been arguing that we may well see a recalibration of the stress response systems at this point, but to truly test it, what we need are kids who have started out under conditions of adversity, but shifted to benign conditions because the strongest test of this is that we see systems that have been calibrated to harsh conditions that only at puberty begin to recalibrate to benign conditions. We had a chance to test this using a, what a design that I think of as a Rondahl design, where you take 12 and 13 year olds because at 12 and 13 years of age you can get all stages of puberty showing up so you can control age. And then we examined um, the cortisol awakening response, um, which is an increase in cortisol from uh, wake up to about 30 minutes post wake up. It's, uh, we don't completely understand why this response exists, but we know it's very sensitive to the stressfulness of your context. And if life is stressful, you get a hyper responsiveness of this. You get an increase in your cortisol awakening response, which if it's chronic, is followed by a down regulation and a blunting of that response. And just very quickly, what we found in looking at children from institutions versus low-risk comparison kids is the ones who were pre or early pubertal showed a very blunted cortisol awakening response relative to low-risk kids. You get the increase in cortisol production with puberty that we typically see. And now for these older, further along in pubertal stage kids, we get no difference in the cortisol awakening response, as if the system now is recalibrated. It took it until puberty. The children had been with their families for 10 years by this time. But at puberty, it recalibrated. Um, so I think it's useful to consider why we see particular behavioral uh, patterns emerge from adverse early life conditions, not only in terms of the proximal level theories that we may need to develop, but also in terms of the function of survival for our species. We got to be careful, though, in recognizing whether we're talking about adaptation <coughs> at the proximal level, where we're interested in physical and mental health, or at the ultimate level, where the real test of the pudding is your reproductive fitness, and hopefully, if we uh, take enough lenses to our elephant, we'll begin to understand better the role of early adversity in human development. Thank you.